Greetings, Slashaholics, and welcome to another episode of After the Slash. I am joined by with the 80 Slash Librarian, Joshua Rue, and David Bergantino, author of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror Twice Burned. Um, I, I, we have our customary two minutes of wrap-up about the book that we're talking seconds. about. 15 <laughs> seconds. Uh, we, that, we, I think we talked about, what, 45 minutes, 50 minutes about it, so I think there's all that can be said about it. Um at least for right now. It's a good who done it. Um I I see I'm proud of that one cuz that's the one I got right from the <laughs> uh, I can't remember if I guessed help wanted right or I'm not. Shamed I'm shamed because you got it right. What's that? I'm shamed because you got it right. Yeah, you got me with virtual terror uh, cuz I didn't see that coming until like until I did like the final upload. Mm-hmm. And uh in fact, I, I split up the final upload so I could give my guess uh, that oh, right. then, then people couldn't say, oh, yeah, you, you're just saying that you had it. But, you know, so I was like, it's like I got I to stop right here, do my guess. And then next time do the ending. Um, I didn't I didn't read ahead. I just I, anyway, anyways, uh, I digress. Uh, fun book. Twice Burn was fun. I'm looking forward to talking about Help Wanted. I can't remember if I guessed the killer right in that one or not, but I know I made more guesses on that one. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to re-listen to it. Um, but yeah, final thoughts on Twice Burn, Sean? Yeah, I thought it was fun. That's what I, it's what I love most about these Freddy Krueger young adult novels is that um, you, you're always guessing. It's it's not so straightforward like a lot of those Black Flame Freddy Krueger books. Yeah. I, I got bored with some of those because they were just too long, but these are perfect size um to read and be entertained the whole time so i don't know how the freddy movie novelizations get the whole story into like 70 pages but like the <laughs> seriously i have narrated not they leave out three. so many details it, it i said it'll be like nancy walked into the room she grabbed a towel and left i'm like what color was the room what did it smell like like in, in a description good. whatsoever Stephen King would have taken four pages to describe the color of the town and how it, and how it reminded him of growing up on a peach farm, you know, <laughs> in, in the summer. You know, you know Stephen King's peaches. Come on. I, don't know. I mean, the scripts are the scripts are like around a hundred pages. How could you? And 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 they're only dialogue. How can you? How can you c- condense that into a novel of seven Not- pages? Nightmare on Elm Street 1, 2, and 3, the novelizations are in one book. The book isn't even 200 pages. Oh Nightmare, on Elm Street, Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5 is in one book, and it's like 180 pages. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm doing Nightmare 5 right now, and it is literally 74 pages is wow. how Nightmare 5 is. What was New Nightmare like? It was a 300-page book. It wasn't. It was, it was around 200 and something, yeah. It wasn't 100 pages. It was... Yeah, you. That's what I'm saying. Like they're really condensed. There, there, there are a few differences too. Like in Nightmare Four, um, we got the elevator death for the brother instead of the invisible Freddy fight because they ran out of budget. Um, Nightmare Five, uh, we got we got an extended scene with Dan in the truck when he falls asleep before he like has the has his death on the motorcycle, uh, which was pretty cool. I just narrated that the other day. Um, Nightmare 3, the novelization, was completely different from the movie because it it was based on the Wes Craven script uh, mm-hmm. more than it was on the finished one, which that was pretty. Cool Freddy was a pimp in that one. Yeah. yeah, he was also a dragon in the in the novelization. He turns into a dragon. Like, it, it had some cool stuff in it. The only, the only part that I hated about it, it, it's cool to have an alternate Dream Warriors to listen to, but instead of the puppet scene... Freddy literally just grabs the guy out of bed, drags him down the hallway, and throws him in front of a van. <laughs> oh wow! Instead of instead of the puppet scene, you know, it's like Freddy's like fuck it, just pitches him in front of a van. I didn't think anything about the fourth one where that, I didn't even think about them running out of budget in the fourth one when that guy fights nothing because Freddy's invisible and bucking with him. That's that's literally a way to do the scene for dirt cheap. That's why they did that. <laughs> Was that, because that, they ran out of budget. <laughs> I love I love finding out about movies when I found out they ran out of budget because I it explains some of the scenes or running out of budget because mm. one of my favorite movies is Willow. I know I know they're making a sequel to it on Netflix, but there are a couple. The only things I have bad to say about the movie 
are potholes that were subtracted because of budget. Like, if they had the budget, it would have been a cohesive story with no loose ends whatsoever. So that, that's just an example of the, the budget being a problem there. Because they, they, like, a lot of times they'll subtract, but then they'll bridge over. But sometimes they just subtract and don't explain anything. Yeah, yeah I hate um, that. I hate when, when producers like try to overpower a director on a movie and they edit it into something totally different than what the director was going for. Like Hellraiser 4. Uh, just I haven't even watched Justice League because I refuse to watch because I know what they did to it. I'm going to watch the Snyder Cut that's like coming out on HBO Max this year. But I have not seen it because they changed it so much and shortened it. Um, the Dark Tower movie, I haven't watched that because they took seven books and put it into one hour and a half movie. I mean, I, I watched it. I felt out of breath when it was done because they just they moved so fucking fast, condensing all of that. Mm-hmm. And they needed like, Aaron Paul as Eddie Dean, like he was the perfect yeah. guy for Eddie Dean, and that's never going to happen now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna watch the stand. I've heard a few good things about it. The new, the remake. I know, I know they cast a lot of unknowns in it because they they wanted to go go in that direction. I, I kind of like that, but because I watched the Goldberg trailer, wanted to play the the old lady in the original stand miniseries. Yeah, and that's why since uh, she didn't get to in that, she's playing her in this one, uh, yeah. in the in the in the remake thing. Uh, the only joke about this other thing I'm gonna make. Is uh, I've been I was binge watching. Um, you guys ever heard of House of Cards? Yeah. <laughs> I was binge watching that, and I was like trying to tell my friend. I was like, "Dude, this is a good." He's like, "Dude, you're watching C-SPAN." <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, what do you What have you been watching uh, lately, David? Uh, in the last couple weeks, I have been watching all of the scan. I watched all the Scanners movies, Scanner the both Scanner Cop movies, and then a couple other. Cronenberg related movies on top of that, like Existence and then uh, Possessor uh, from Brandon Cronenberg. So I've sort of had a Scanners Cronenberg thing going on for the last couple of weeks. And you were telling us that something from Scanners was ripped off in Wonder Woman? Yes. The last act, including the catsuit of, of Wonder Woman 84, is taken almost directly from. Uh, Scanners three takeover. The the ending is exactly the same. Can I uh, lose some of my eighty slasher cred real quick? I've never seen Scanners. Oh, never seen, I never I recommend Scanners. it. Okay, I, I, it's on my list. It's something I want to watch. But we're all making confessions. I've never seen the Sandlot, so I completely I've never get. Seen I haven't okay. seen since I was a kid. So if we're, all, um, if we're all saying movies we, we haven't seen that we probably should. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've seen Scanners a long time ago, and um, dude, it was honestly, good. Honestly, with you, I'm more shocked when you tell me you have seen a movie. <laughs> oh, okay, I've been out of the game for a little wow. while. Okay, I'm gonna fade into my beans. Now. <laughs> oh, kind of looked like it for a minute. How many times have I told you, Sean, you're fired because like I bring up a good, you know, like. Oh my God! I love Friday the Thirteenth. Uh, you know, Jason X. He's like, I haven't. I've never seen that one. Oh <laughs> bullshit! That was one of my first horror movies. No, no, I'm just saying that's what it feels like sometimes. Yeah. Hey, you know, I've never seen Scanners, but I have seen every Silent Night, uh, Deadly Night, like y'all were talking about earlier. Oh wow! Back, okay. Uh, um, I, I watched one, two, three, four. I, I, I don't think I saw the fourth and fifth ones. I used to go rent horror movies like uh, every weekend. And I would just, you know, I'd, I'd rent like a whole series and take it home and watch it. I regretted that on Deadly, uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Um, uh, and yeah, the second one is just a rehash of the first. Carnosaur. They really, does, they really does. stretch the concept of a killer Santa to where it's not really about killer Santas, but they're still calling it Silent Night, Deadly right. Night. Night of the Demons was like the same thing. Every movie was like the exact same plot with just, you know, different character names. Um. Yeah, I, I I don't know how I never saw scanners. Honestly, well, that's right. You just mentioned Carnosaur. We've talked about Car- Carnosaur before. Um, on on Messenger, right? Yeah, you were um, telling me about that. Yeah, I did. Uh, we did an episode mm-hmm. of Slash Tracks where we uh, riffed on Carnosaur and Carnosaur Two. 
Um, right. Because I yeah. think I told you a good friend of mine is in Carnosaur 1. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Carnosaur 1 is based on a novel. Um, they changed the story a lot, a lot. Um, but like they, they, they actually made like almost $2 million at the box office on Carnosaur. It, it came out around the time Jurassic Park did. Uh, so like people had dinosaur fever and I guess right. some people went and saw it and probably regretted that very well, much. That's like, uh, that's like around the, the abyss coming out. There was like Leviathan and deep star six and, and all these, all these underwater monster movies who were trying to get the jump on the abyss. And then the abyss comes out and it's an entirely different sort of movie. I wonder if anybody fell asleep during close encounters, whenever it was in theaters. Cause that was like alien fever going on at the time. And, uh, because that movie, I've tried watching Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, yeah. And I, I never make it through. I've never seen the whole movie. Man, I, I, I was like opening weekend for that movie. I, I haven't seen it in years, so I don't know how it holds up. But I, for me, when it came out, it was transformative in terms of... Because I had alien fever at the time, too. So, you didn't think it was like too boring and non... Uh, it, it had this... Thing, this ethereal fantasy thing going on, this feeling that 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 made it not boring. Maybe it I should try it again. Mystical feel to it, like the way I felt when I would have dreams about aliens, or because I was reading everything on Earth there was about aliens and stuff like that. So it had the feel for me. It had the feel of how I felt when I would look for aliens. <laughs> I feel like we're we're gonna we go through these uh, genre fever areas like we had zombie fever for a few years. We're kind of at the ass end of superhero fever. I'm wondering what the next run's gonna be. You know, at least it's a firm ass. The superhero ass. <laughs> Some of them, Captain <laughs> Captain America wasn't there. You know, in the end of uh, been a little wait there after, uh, at the end of Avengers there with the with the run up in the future. Oh, yes. Um, but yeah, uh, what what do you guys think the next fever is going to be? Um, now that zombie fever's faded, superhero, you know, is kind of fading. What's the next one going to be? I'd love a slasher renaissance. That would be cool. Yeah, yeah, that- but the remakes haven't been catching the way they thought they would because I know a lot of the studios tried to remake all of the original slashers to catch that. Fever, but then a lot of them took a couple different directions. A couple tried to make it PG-13, and it killed the vibe because they were trying to get to a bigger audience. And then some tried to redo the story for a modern setting, and it didn't... Some of them landed, some of them didn't. I feel like like Halloween 2018 worked, and I'm hoping that a lot of these, instead of trying to reboot and remake, they'll do what Halloween did, ignore the remakes they've already done, and do a sequel, you know, pick back up on the original story. Uh, does that work for Halloween? Yeah, I, like I, see, I, I like the concept of that, of just saying, you know what, all of that, that it didn't, it doesn't exist. Here's the, here's the real story, um, you know, of, of Laurie Strode. You know, let's just stick with that story. I like that. I did not like 2018. Oh, wait, no, I'm not saying I liked it, because, like, I'm a big critic of them wiping everything out. I was a big critic of that, because the sibling storyline, to me, is what made Michael scary, because no matter where she went in life, no matter what she tried to do with her life, as long as her brother was alive, she was never going to have peace. But then in 2018, when they're not even related, I know we've already talked about this on the show, we've talked about it to death, Sean, but... I don't think we did with David. Um, the fact that some random victim that got away from him 40 years ago is somehow the center of his obsession. You know, yeah. other, other people escaped him in, in the original Halloween. It, yeah. w- it would have made more sense if when he escaped, Lori went on the hunt for him than for him to go on the hunt for Lori. Um, but what I mean is the movie did good at the box office. It made a lot of money for the studio. Oh. I don't want nightmare or friday the 13th to ignore their sequels like halloween did 
What I mean is maybe they can ignore their remakes and not try to keep remaking and rebooting with with uh, resetting everything, but making a sequel, making Friday the 13th Part 13, not Friday the 13th, the remake, the second remake, you know what I mean? Or Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, the second remake. I know I know that Robert's, Robert's getting way up there, and I, the longer they take, the less likely he is to step in. But they can do a lot with CGI, uh, yeah. with faces and stuff. They can do a lot with uh, stunt workers now, especially in a costume and makeup like Freddy wears. So they could do it with Robert, and he would not have to do as many stunts and stuff as he used to. Like, they could pull it off. Well, yeah, my view on all of that is, is basically Bond. Is 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 and what they did with Batman is if they've got good movies and they've got good actors, then let's let's keep going. They they flubbed it. You would almost thought that that the remake should have been good because they they picked a good actor to be Freddy. But yeah, the whole thing he, was flat. He did good in the role. He was one of the better things about it. Yeah, if they can do both of those at once, like they've done with Bond, is 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 match a new actor with a n- new take or or a continuation of it in some way, fine. But you know, the the problem is is is, I mean, with the other stuff, not 2018. I think actually 2018 was in that respect a legit, you know, like a legit effort. The, it's sort of like the reboot mentality and what you were saying about producers kind of overcomes what was really the work of like John Carpenter and Wes Craven, like this imagination that gave birth to these things. Here, they're coming from outside, whereas the characters and the movies all came from the inside. I just look like, uh, forget what I was doing there. Um, so, you know, I, if... They manage to do things like that with some series that aren't horror. If horror can figure that out, then then we'll have a better shot at 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 having these franchises be cool for a really long time and not have them rely on sing, you know one person. It's just such a sin that we don't have a Friday the Thirteenth Part Thirteen. No, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Oh, so I saw how. By the way, complete weird side note. I saw Halloween two the other night, and I noticed something I'd never noticed before. It it's freaking me out. You know, it's the same thing as the end of one, where Loomis shoots him, and then he staggers backwards and falls over the railing. Have you ever seen what actually happens when he falls over the railing? There's a a, a low shot of. Uh, that looks up into the into the into the um, balcony, and he, he, what should happen is he should stagger up to the railing and sort of flip over, you know, having to catch him in the waist. He just walks up a ramp and falls over. Really? Yeah, I never noticed that before. But I'm looking at that go, and I replayed it a couple times. I'm like, that's unnatural. He and you can't see it because it's blocked by the railing, but he just. Walks up a, 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 an incline and steps over the railing and falls. Check I'll it out. To, I'll have to check that out. It like, was really ha- bizarre. Halloween Two is one of my favorite is 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 my favorite slasher sequel of all time. The original Halloween Two. Mm-hmm. Um, same with Child's Play Two. Those I think those are two of the greatest sequels. And now Zombie Land Two goes on that list for me. Oh, that's right. I still have to see that. But. Um, the thing about Halloween 2 that I, every time I watch it, it, it comes more abundantly clear to me, is how rushed it was. But it's proof that a rushed movie can still be great, if done right. But mm-hmm. Halloween 2 was rushed as hell. If you, The more you watch it, the more you'll see that. Uh, you know, they were... I know it didn't come out for... It didn't come out right after. What I mean is, like, the movie... The production? Yeah, it just feels rushed. Uh, but they did a great job with it, John. Yeah, it's one of my it's one of my favorites too, and and some of the kills in that are where I started get were were sort of the start of me thinking of interesting ways of killing people, <laughs> like like when the when the remember that when the do- if something happens. Yeah, when the doctor is on the table and was bleeding out, and then he discovers her, and then he goes like, "Oh, it's dripping," and then he turns, and then. You get this big shot of the giant pool of blood, and he, you know, so I, that is like one of my favorite s- scenes of all time. 
I just love it. Thought John on the on the re the remake reboot uh, stuff. No, I mean I I pretty much agree with it. I just think there's uh I don't I don't know what there is to say that I haven't rated about in so many of these after the slashes. At a what do you have on your list? Um, I wrote down Wrong Turn Seven slash remake and the Clarice Starling TV show. Let's those. Dude, those, let's uh, on this on this uh, wrong turn business first. That's uh, yeah. I was curious about that earlier. I was mild, mildly curious about the wrong turn, but that series kind of just fizzled out a little bit. And then my wife and I are watching uh, YouTube, and we see this half naked biker chick in Wrong Turn Seven. I'm like, okay, we're both like, color me interested. Uh, first of all, that ain't that ain't in the remake. That that is apparently in the sixth movie. Um, so we watched the trailer for nothing. I was like. Where's the biker lady? Biker lady, come back and fix this. <laughs> um, but we're watching the trailer for the remake, and I gotta say, the trailer does not do the images I've seen justice. The trailer is very vague. Oh, something's in the woods. Something's trying to kill us. They've lived in the woods for a while. What are we gonna do? Ah, track is set. Wrong turn. I'm like, that didn't tell me shit. So... <laughs> Um, Arrow in the Head News has been showing images, apparently, in the Appalachians. They're they're rebooting the story a little bit. They're going to go more into the families, but I don't know if they're going to be extremely deformed. I know that the three main protectors no. of the people are based on animals. There's the boar, the stag, and something else. And they've taken bones and furs from these animals to make suits and masks. Like, the, the the deer one has stitches going down the middle of the skull, and it looks fucking freaky as hell. You don't see any of that in the trailer. Is it like a, is it a buck with horns? Does it have horns? Yeah. That's cool. Okay, that, that, I can, I can yeah. see that being yeah. wicked looking. Those are, uh, those are, I could see them not wanting to show that in the trailer. That's pretty powerful. You, you. Yeah, but I would have wanted to see, like, see okay, do uh, you remember, in the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the, the remake in 2003, you don't really see Leatherface in the trailer at all, but at the very end of the trailer, he, like, dives into his room, and you see a flash of his face before he slams the door. Like, there should have been maybe something like that. Just yeah, very, yeah. very small, but you don't, you don't really get any taste in the trailer at all. Yeah, but, that's, that, that's a big problem nowadays, is trailers giving way too much away. Uh, yeah. Ghostbusters 2016 gave the whole movie away. A lot of these superhero yeah. movies gives the whole movie away. That's a perennial uh, trailer problem. Yeah, the, it's getting the bad. The is when you get trailers that that, that at least one and, and sometimes half the trailer is all made of footage that never made it into the final cut of the film. Oh, oh that, that was bad. So annoying. I hate Man that. Piece. That drives me crazy. Where I'm like, wait a second, what about that? Hey, um, <laughs> I'll tell you one, based on what I've read, the trailer was was really done well, and that's Ghostbusters Afterlife. Because uh-huh. uh, what the trailer does is kind of set the tone of what the movie's going to be like, but it doesn't give a lot of the stuff away. But what I've read is there's a lot of big stuff happening in this movie, and the trailer didn't throw that in. It, I'm, it's going to be coming out in a few months, so they might put out more trailers. But my hope is they follow the tone they set with the first trailer. Don't give too much away on this, because there's some big payoffs that I've read about from spoilers, um, you know, including the original Ghostbusters suiting up and helping fight the final battle and stuff. Um, I don't want that to be given away in the trailer. You know, I want to see that on the big screen. I, you I know, want to give that away right here. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of just told people it's going to be in the movie from a spoiler thing, but I mean, I think we all kind of expected that, but I don't want to see it in the trailer. You know what I mean? I want to be in the theater or watching it on demand and, mm-hmm. Because I grew up on this franchise. I've been wanting a third one for years. Uh, they did a video game in 2009 where all the original guys did the voices. And it's kind of like a third one if you play it out. It takes place in 1992. Um, but to see the surviving Ghostbusters suiting up, helping fight in this big battle, is going to be an epic moment for fans of this series. And I hope that they don't even tease that in the trailer. Don't even show a little glimpse of it. That's what we need. There, there's trailer fatigue, really. Trailers are just doing way too much. They're giving away too much. Uh, what do you think, Sean? You think trailers are, are need to need to tone back a little bit nowadays? 
I think they need to go back to trailers being in an art form because I've def- I've seen trailers that don't show anything. I've seen ones that show stuff that never happened or recut scenes and stuff. I think that they need to stop More being the produced. Things. They need to stop being produced so damn fast. People need to take time to let it marinate and do it well. But it, it's the mass production of being faster and faster. But one one trailer I saw that actually was done well is a show that's coming out. It's called Clarice. Now, the, the Hannibal TV show came out a couple of years ago, and apparently there was a fight between that studio and the studio that wanted to make the Clarice TV show. That's why they wouldn't let Clarice be in the Hannibal show, because they were doing their own show, but it didn't come out until after Hannibal, and they're not doing Hannibal Lecter. She is in the show. She took down Buffalo Bill. Um, she rescued Catherine Martin from the pit, and now she's hunting serial killers. So I'm like, so how is this different than C- CSI? But it's CSI with Clarice Starling, but apparently they're trying to go into her origins, and I'm just like, okay. I give it a year. I Maybe mean, it'll be like Millennium, where it's all dark and twisted, and not I just... I like that show. Yeah, I well, that's... I, that. it's, I mean, I, I like it. I love it. Lance Hendrickson, though. Oh, yeah. But, like, it, it got a little too dark even to be enjoyable for me at some point. But but it was all about that sort of, like, hyper-stylized... It was, like, seven every week. Yeah. <clears throat> and That so, show and Twin Peaks were, like, ahead of their time, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, Twin yeah, Peaks I, tried to do a revival, and it just didn't work. I wish Carnival would do some kind of limited reboot to tie up that story, because that was a really interesting... Have either of you guys ever seen that show? I'm aware of it. I haven't seen it, though. It's def... Okay, I don't usually recommend shows that were canceled abruptly mm-hmm. because, you know, it's not fair to get into a really good show and then not get a conclusion. But Carnival is one you should really check out. It only had two seasons, but they have really good, uh, interesting characters. The actors do a fantastic job. And the storyline is really unique, and it, it really pulls you in. It's kind of like Lost, if Lost knew what the fuck they were doing. <laughs> you know, and not just making it up as they went. There's a lot of mystique to the story, um, and they never got a chance. They were going to do one final season, the third season, and they didn't get to. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out Carnival. Um, but um, have you ever seen the Lance Henriksen show we were talking about, Sean? No. Nope. There it is. There it is. You're fired. Ah, uh, my weekly firing. <laughs> no, it's a good show, but he's right. It was really. It's really kind of a twisted show. It was definitely ahead of its time, uh, you know, kind of like Twin Twin Peaks was too. Um, yeah, that's it's been a fun fun discussion. Um, uh, what well, one one fun one fun fact before we wrap up? Um, I was rewatching Rush Hour, and <laughs> the TV show or the movies? Because that's the, like the Millennium. Um, you know, remember the part where Jackie Chan is hanging on the railing and he's like, catch me, I'm about to fall, because Juntao just fell and died in the pool. Right when Jackie Chan lets go, there's a camera crew on the balcony. <laughs> and when he, when he oh, continues shit. falling, it pans up and you don't see anything anymore. But I, usually I don't see anything that blatant. And I've seen this movie so many times since I was a kid. And right when he falls, I'm just like, how do you miss the three people with a camera that it's lighting shooting it um it, it, it was funny i just kept rewatching it over and over to make sure i wasn't crazy i didn't know they made a tv series out of that a couple years ago yep yeah that got canceled like really quick or something yep. um i didn't know taken had a tv series uh for a that, while that i didn't know yeah and you know netflix i gotta say this real quick i'm not gonna let this turn into a discussion on on modern on things that are going on right now but netflix did something really twisted to me and i don't know how why they would do this but i got on there the other day and my number one recommended show to watch was a Kiefer sutherland show called designated survivor oh yeah and that show starts off with the federal capital being blown up and like the entire government being taken out yeah. and he, and, and he is like the deputy of uh, HUD, you know, he's yeah. like way down on the list and it's a unique premise. But like, I was like, what the hell is this? My number one, you know, it's, it seemed like it seemed inappropriate. Yeah. 
Was it uh, was it a recommendation or was it trending because everybody started watching it because of what happened? That might that be what it was. Too. That might it might have been trending. Yeah, it's you're like, right. You, you, can't, you can't you can't pull one over on our our fortune teller in the beans over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know it probably was on the trending list. It was like right there, and uh, anyways, I just thought that was kind of uh, strange. Yeah. But it's um, like when the pandemic started and all the pandemic movies, yeah, like, like pandemic sir. was the name of the movie that popped up on that. You right, know? right. Um, but you know that's uh, I'm really doing research. Yeah, this my my daughter uh, had to get tested today. Um, from because of a school thing so i've been i've been worried about that but uh I, i'm glad to see the vaccines rolling out and stuff um i don't want to end on that though there, there was something i wanted to oh i wanted uh-huh. to bring up scary stories to tell in the dark oh yes uh yeah uh these uh, this author and his best friend that is like an amazing artist took the premise of the original scary stories to tell in the dark books by alvin shorts and uh I just had the name of the, the artist right on the tip of my tongue. I cannot remember. Gamble, some, Stephen Gamble, I think. And uh, they made this book. They, they did a fund rate, GoFundMe and stuff for it. It's called Scary Stories Telling the Dark, Tribute to Terror. It's got like 60 stories, two, like 200 pages. The one, back then, they were like 50-page books. You mm-hmm. got like 10, 12 stories total. This one, the art is identical. The guy that wrote the stories really brings in the style of, of storytelling that Alvin did, like folklore and original stories. So all you patrons, uh, check out the post section. I went and bought, and I, I paid for uh, over 30 PDF copies of the book uh, to give to all of you as a gift uh, for supporting the channel. Go to the post section. There's a link to Google Drive where you can download the PDF. Check it out. It's really, if you're a fan of the, if you read those when you were a kid, uh, you're going to really enjoy it. I've read like 10 of the stories so far. The art is so chilling. Even to this day, looking back at the old books, that, that, that art is what drew me in and scared me, gave me nightmares, but in a good way. And this one, the guy captures that. Um, I'm going to send you a link, David. And uh, Sean, be sure to get your copy, too. Uh, it's really good. It's 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 long, too. And they're, they're going to do another one if this is su- successful. So, uh uh, go. Uh, there's a website. I'll put a link in the description where you can buy a physical copy of the book uh, for $19. PDF is 10, but you've already got that. You can also get the physical copy and the audio book of it for 25. Uh, but yeah, if you support it, buy you know buy some copies, give them away, and uh, if, if it's successful, they're going to do more. So I would like to see that. Cool. Um, any any closing any uh, projects or anything you want to discuss, uh, David? What's going on? Uh, nothing. Oh, well, actually, I was just asked to uh, contribute a short story for a Christmas themed horror anthology um, that's going to come out next year. So that'll be my next my first my first written like my first published short story. And then the first thing I've written uh, for about 10 years. So. Uh, that That's will get cool. out to the public. So I'm I'm really excited about that. I've got a, some some fairly fairly twisted ideas of what I'm going to do. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm looking forward to uh, Alien versus Predator. Uh, Dr. Pepper drinking game with you and Roger too. Oh, that's going to be a blast. Yeah, because the Freddy versus Jason one was great. That was uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much for supporting the channel. Uh, David, thank you for hanging with us. It's always it's always a blast to have you here. Uh, time just flies by. And, yeah, I have uh, a lot of fun. Um, thanks for thanks for having me as always. Yeah, anytime you want to come on after the slash, man. Anytime, and we'll we'll get uh, episodes scheduled soon for uh, help wanted. Um, cool. Sean, thanks for hanging. I know you're tired. Got to get up early. Uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Three, three m huh? is a push. Three yeah. m is a big push. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you all for supporting the channel loving each and every one of you Uh, be excellent to each other and uh, we'll see you on the next episode of After the Slash have a good night good night